I think mm -hmm. internally in our own communities, we need to be relearning. Um, and what I, the language that a Mi'kmaq elder used was activating our blood memories. And so it's like when you get that full body chill, if there's a beautiful song or a prayer or powerful words that have been spoken yeah. and you get the goosebumps, yeah. um, and that's our blood memories being activated. Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson, and I'm in Victoria on Vancouver Island in British Columbia. I'm with Pawa Hayupus, is that right? Is that pronounced right? Yes. Who was a First Nations woman, and, and our first experience, thank you for joining me, I should say, my first experience being with someone in a very different culture. I mean, partly a different culture, and partly also you're in Western culture. So help us to understand a little bit about your life, your people, their concerns, their issues. Help us to learn, because in the, in the United States, we hear very little about First Nations people. They're very marginalized. Mm -hmm. But here, you know, in the six months we've been here, I, I, see, I see people on the street, I see much more in the news, your, your presence here. Mm -hmm. Help us learn about you. Okay. Um, Maybe starting with you. To Uklasish Pawat Squachit. Uh, my full name is Pawet Squichit. Histak Shils Ahuzet. I'm from Ahuzet, which is on the west coast of Vancouver Island. And our relatives are, who are also Nuchanath, are the Macaw, uh, the whalers in uh, Washington on the um, Olympic Peninsula. And uh, Ma'as Klakish Peel. So my house, I come from the house of Klakish Peel, which is the house of whale fat. Mm. And uh, whale fat used to be a commodity up and down the coast, something we traded for. And, um, and so, yeah, it's just kind of a, a, a sign of wealth as well. And not everybody on the coast were whalers. So oh. that is something that's quite specific to, to my nation. And... Um, and uh, we're meeting today on the Songhees Reserve, which is also a First Nation. They're Coast Salish, and mm. there's three First Nations on the island. There's the Coast Salish, the Nuchanath, and the Kwakwakwiwath, um, and the north part of the island. And so uh, just wanting to, to honor mm. the Coast mm. Salish people for and not only allowing me to live in their territory and work in their territory, um, but just to enjoy enjoy the beauty of their territory. And as is protocol, we always thank the people, um, the land, and the ancestors who have also stewarded the land and the territory before. And so that's just a little bit about how we would introduce ourselves in almost any culture that we go to. We want to know who we are, where we're from, and also how do I know you or your family or is there a connection or a relation? Mm. So, mm. so the relationships become very important to identify and to put somebody, um, oh, this is who you are, this is where you're from, this is the house you belong to, I, 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 know, I know you, I know your people. So Even if you've never met or if it's a totally new visit, yes. it's like you find where are those connections. Yeah. How do you honor that land also? I mean, did I hear you right? And so, yeah, so because we're meeting here in uh, Coast Salish territory, we just want to honor, it's more like the spirit of all of creation. So mm. to keep it simple, we, we say the land or, you know, the territory, but it's, it's really just honoring all life uh, because we do have relationships with, with even some of the small things that we don't see or the things we take for granted, like fresh water, mm, clean mm. water, clean air. Then for um, here we would be saying thank you for the cedars and the clean and the rains yeah. and the and the, the big fish. rocks and like okay. what feeds us, what mm. what takes care yeah. of us, what sustains us. Yeah. Yes. So thank you. so it's just to have that gratitude. Um, and then of course if someone has cooked a wonderful meal for us then we would um, my people we always 
we always honor that. We always thank the cooks because that, that it's, it's a, such an important role to nourish our bodies well, when we come together to do important work that, that we're taking care of in that way. Boy, it feels fundamental. I mean, it feels it like uh, you're down to the essence of what really, really, really matters. Mm. So you also have a, a part of your life in the mainstream, mm -hmm. right? But you, tell us a little bit about your education and your work, and tell us more about you know, what, what motivates the First Nations people at this time, or what they're concerned about. Hmm. Well, that's loaded. Yeah. Where to start? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I pick whatever one you want to pick. So for me, I think my like my journey. Um, we're born. Uh, I, I'm lucky. I came from. Uh, I my father is quite traditional, and um, so he brought me and my brother, and I'm sure my brother enjoyed this much more than me, and in retrospect, I, I really appreciate the teachings I got going hunting, mm -hmm. fishing, um, being around uh, traditional native medicines, which, you know, come from the earth, and so having that connection and that relationship to our food source, like, oh, you know, here's the duck I'm going to, you know, clean and eat. Right, and so just being a part of that and appreciating um, those things uh, has just been has been ingrained in me um, because of my my upbringing, and uh, I've always felt very connected to spirit, to energy, um, and able to sense to able to sense you know what's right and what's wrong, mm -hmm. and so. And so my journey has uh, brought my education, um, besides having um, been raised that way, like we grew up here in Victoria, but my dad always, you know, would take us down to the beach to get the sea urchins or um, the highest dupar, the chitons. So, oh. you know, we eat so much from, from the from the ocean, the elders say the low tide is our grocery store. Mm. And so, mm. so having, mm. you know, protecting oceans, ha is having, you know, um, the pipelines, so something that's a huge issue today is having pipelines come into our territories. And of course they say, you know, oh, don't worry, we'll, you know, we'll manage any leaks. But the, the case to date is that uh, people don't know how to manage yes. um, oil leaks. And uh, the, the BP in the Gulf, you know, was that to 2010, 2011, you know, and there's still remnants. Um, Exxon Valdez, you know, was a yes. couple decades ago, but you know, we it's still very much in our in our memory. We know it, and so, and so the the most of our right now for First Nations people, uh, for me, and the work I do is around Aboriginal rights, Aboriginal title. So that connects us back to the land. And for me, right now, we're in Songhees territory, but where my Aboriginal rights and title come from is in my indigenous territory where I come from and so that again is how important that relationship is mm. to our homelands our motherlands and and the the territories our ancestors came from and because of colonization sometimes we get confused where do I really belong um, I work with young people um, and of course in our First Nations communities because of the the historical context of what people call colonization, um, we're left with um, uh, suicide, you know, high suicide rates. Uh, we are the the uh, numbers of children who are in foster care are it's just it's too much. And then um, once you become institutionalized, these young people become institutionalized. Many of them end up in the penitentiaries. Mm -hmm. And then you look mm -hmm. at the, the statistics of First Nations in the penitentiaries and in jails and in those systems. And we're the most, um, the most prominent ones demographically there. And yet our population is in all of Canada. We're still so small that we're actually quite invisible. Um, mm -hmm. If you look at mainstream media or or whatnot, you know we're still our story is still there's a lot of racism, and and you, we sense it in small towns. Like m many of us, just kind of grow up with it and we we live with it. And yet, um, 
And yet there comes a time when we don't want the younger generations mm. to live with that anymore. Mm. And so mm. um, I feel one of the issues definitely is identity, belonging, and reclaiming, you know, um, and learning to stand up and say, actually, when you wear a chief's headdress as um, a, a non-native, uh, a person that's quite insulting. Uh, and so, you know, trying to say don't do that, and yet people continue to do that because for some reason it's okay to treat us in a mean way um, by claiming ignorance. And so I feel possibly TV shows like this might be able to get that, that voice out or maybe open up some, some dialogue or conversation because it shouldn't be like you're wrong and you're bad, but like the elders taught us. If I haven't been taught what's right and what's wrong, then, then the spirits are going to for have forgiveness. Mm. The ancestors will have forgiveness because I haven't been taught. But once I've been taught, you know. You're expected to live that to that. Yeah. yeah, and then I still do the wrong thing, then the consequences start to come in. I, the, the, kind, the words that come up for me as you speak is one, one of them is respect. Mm. And the other is that you're, that is, how do I respect your culture, your traditions, and so on? and the example you gave. And you're coming up against the dominant culture, mm. which, which is patriarchal and which assumes that it's above every other culture. I will say offhand, white males, the white male system, even if it's not just white males, behaving that way. Mm -hmm. So you're, the First Nations peoples everywhere have been genocide, killed off, your lands taken, not respected, treated as second class beings. So part of what I hear is we need to reverse that and come back with a kind of respect and say you ha your cultures lived for thousands and thousands and thousands of years sustainably here in the Pacific Northwest and we've destroyed it in a couple centuries. We have a lot we should be asking to learn from you. And we aren't humble enough, perhaps, yet to do that. We're still exploiting. Anyway, those are some thoughts that, as you talk, come to me. I think that there's um, um, definitely uh, uh, a time of learning and a time of sharing. And, and then w because of where we are right now in the context of like all the layers of colonization and the impacts, mm -hmm. things like residential school or legislation and policy that continue ex to exist in things like the Indian Act in Canada. And I'm sure the states has, has their own sets of federal policies that contain yes, the Indian problem. Sure. And, and, um, and, so, and so because of all of the impact of all these things at all these levels, our own people have to learn as well um, to oh. relearn what it is to even something simple like respect, right? It's something that oh. is actually 24 seven. And when we start to live our life with that principle and fully, fully step into that footprint of what it is to live respecting, not just humanity, but the little flea on my dog, you know, has a life too. And um, and in the, uh, an elder said that in the eyes of creator, that's what being humble is. I am just a tiny little flea in the mm. eyes of creator and in the context of the whole universe. And so, so mm. I think mm. internally in our own communities, we need to be relearning. Um, and what I, the language that a Mi'kmaq elder used was activating our blood memories. And so it's like when you get that full body chill if there's a beautiful song or a prayer or powerful words that have been spoken yeah. and you get the goosebumps, yeah. um, and that's our blood memories being activated. So the kind of work I like to do with, with young emerging leaders, and, and I also find that anybody can appreciate the, the, um, the gifts that come out of these kinds of learning journeys is, is to activate blood memories. So what are your creation stories? So learn your creation stories. Um, what are the sacred sites in your in your territory? 
you know, and to go back to your territory. So it's not to like sit in the downtown Sheraton, you know, hotel and talk about how important culture, spirituality and language is, but it's actually to create spaces where we're practicing the culture, we're going on medicine walks, we're doing sweats, you know, in safe space safe spaces, and we're learning about um, uh, our creation stories and the sacred sites and our culture. Uh, and I'm, I'm very uh, privileged, I feel, to, because I work with young people, the elders and spiritual leaders who show up and, and in, the, in these gatherings, they want to give all of their knowledge and everything of them to these other young participants. And just I'm just a, you know, a witness to that. And so for me, I, I've really taken a lot of what the needs are. I've, I've listened to, I've worked with young people now for um, about 12 years. And so the first few years was just being in the same conversation around the needs. Mm -hmm. And now, mm -hmm. it, and then developing uh, curriculum to actually, like I said, activate their blood memories and get them um, exploring some of these uh, um, it's so easy. So we have one thing that's called a mentorship bundle. And yes, walking in, learning how to write a resume or what's your mm -hmm. educational plan mm -hmm. and your career plan and what are the goals and action items you need to get there. But then also, what is your traditional bundle? You know, wh what, what is your Indian name? You know, do you know how to introduce yourself in your native culture? Do you know what clan you come from? Um, do you want to learn some of the language and how are you going to do that? And who are the elders in your community that you can talk to? Because, you know, I'm New Chanath and great, I can go learn Mi'kmaq or Cree culture, but that's still a, not a match to my genetic DNA comes from the West Coast. So my food, um, my songs, my dances, my language, all of that uh, activates my blood memories. And, um, and so just being able to, to share some of those experiences on, at a collective level has been very uh, important. And I think that more of that is needed so that the young people grow up wanting to uh, hunt fish, collect Ooh. berries, you know, uh, forage the forests like bears, you know, like like that they want to do that. And it's not about going to the mall and uh, uh, gaming out or, you know, that's OK in moderation. But I really feel that mm. to be balanced Indigenous in these days, we do need to make that effort to build these into our action items and our to do lists and our um, professional development plans. I have a small pang of loss because I come from a heritage where that has been broken. And so mm -hmm. I have elders that I can turn right to and say, you know, how do we fish in Northern Scotland? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, cause I, that, those lines are lost. Mm -hmm. So there's a little pang there. The other place that I want to go though is what kind of response are you getting from young people? I hear this about building, building esteem mm -hmm. about my traditional roots. And are young people responding? How are they? How oh, yes. I think it's definitely something that, um, of, of course, you know, everybody's at a different place on their journey. So um, there's always those, the, the young people who might be more disengaged. And then there's the young keeners who want to start a youth council or they want to participate more um, with, it, with the leadership at the decision making levels. And so, and so what we call um, a house of youth, it's like a mentorship, it's like a waterfall effect. So I'm now considered an honorary youth uh, <laughs> because there's always somebody younger than us. So how can I reach out and help hold a handout or create space or open a door for another young person to have opportunities. And so are you doing that with, each, so young people are mentoring younger Other people? Other younger people. I see. Okay. And there's even younger people mentoring older people. So that kind of a relationship is reciprocal. It goes mm. both ways if we're open, if we're open to, to learning and not just teaching, right? So it's really that kind of a, a, a give and take um, uh, learning space that, that really we try and create and and so I feel that maybe we don't get, do we don't activate everyone's blood memory, um, and and then the ones who do um, feel it, uh, 
they then know that there's this other path and they can start exploring that more and connecting and, and networking. So having these gatherings where, where you get to network with other people who have a similar passion and then you you start to build your community, you start to get your tribe together, you know, because some people, um, we have different interests, you know, and, and each of those are, are, you, are gifts that should be, um, and sometimes, yeah, we feel so alone in our communities, like no one else gets me. Mm. So, well, in a way, that happens in every culture, but exactly. if you're also trying to, to reinvigorate, remember and mm -hmm. reinvigorate your, your cultural bloodlines, I imagine that's even, that has even more challenge, different challenges than, than, than we might even imagine. Go ahead. You mentioned also like the pain that you feel that you can't go and learn how to fish in Northern Scotland. And that's a similar pain that, that, um, that I feel on a very personal level. Uh, and, <clears throat> And having the opportunity to learn from some of our elders and hereditary chiefs, uh, I feel that there, again, there's a path that's there that we haven't lived and we haven't practiced fully and completely. Um, and, and yet there's little footprints that are there that if I just practice something a little more, um, for instance, uh, well, to me, I'm thinking of the learning village. So the learning village is, you know, uh, going back to our traditional territories. It's uh, building on the land. It's being off grid. It's um, being seasonal. So like mm. knowing, you know, where to, uh, when to harvest, uh, what foods and what medicines. And, and it's also a lot about... Um, uh, a, a group of us have talked about doing a lot of that in in our language so Ooh. that uh, so yeah so then wow. we are learning at all these different levels and um, and so for me and then nobody's has done this and so like so it's it's trailblazing um, finding my people like who else wants to do this and amazingly there's a group of people who are on the same journey um, mm -hmm. they're from the same mm -hmm. tribe as mm -hmm. me and and so it feels like and we we all went to school and we all had the same teacher so we all went to college at the same time and um, hmm. and and now we've all kind of come back and this is what we're wanting to do with our families and um, and just to uh, find the courage to just try something new because what is available right now isn't making us fully happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's something missing. And it's, it's beyond dreaming about like, oh, what was it that the ancestor just did? Or reading in books and researching. It's actually about like, can we just go practice it? Because I think that's where... Um, so if you went to Northern Scotland to just go fishing, you know, yeah, yeah. like, and just to be out there and try and figure it out again. Uh, there's a beautiful story that an elder in residence, um, Ellen White, she's from Snanaimoth, and she's talked about this, um, this man who went up to the mountains and a song came to him. And so when he came back down to the village, he gathered the elders together and he sang the song to them. And as he was singing the song, the elders were crying because, uh, and he said, why are you crying? They said, we haven't heard the song since we were this big. So the song went away and then it came back. Goosebumps. And so, the, so this is the kind of, you're holding that space for, for what was lost to come back. Um, but we also have to, it's, like I said, we can't do that in the Sheraton hotels. Yeah. We have yeah. to do that in our territories. We have to do that on the land. We have to do that supported by, you know, elders and um, people who, who know and understand uh, some of that, the stories and the wisdom that um, as oral cultures, you know, uh, that are now going to literature, you know, some of that information um, isn't, isn't being passed on so simply and so easily. Sure. It's not so accessible. Um, many of our people tune out. So some of our people are, are 
um, maybe uh, through addictions or whatever it is, uh, mental wellness. You know, a lot of our people are in so many different states of wellness and well-being mm -hmm. that um, that we really, you know, it's not that we can leave anybody behind and get too ahead of ourselves, but we've always got to be trying to do this together. What an inspiring image. We have one minute left here. I have the sense of the Aboriginal Australians. Who, the wisdom is in the land that the man, the story you told, the man bringing that mm -hmm. song that had not been heard and finding it, mm -hmm. that, 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 that being, in, it's critical to be in your land among your people because that's, only, that, that's gonna create the space yes. for those to come through. One last minute. Uh, definitely, I think that we have to be connected to the land uh, and, and even more so we have to be connected to our food because Indigenous sovereignty, Aboriginal rights and title, it all comes down to our food and our food sources and same with protecting a lot of the, the um, uh, I don't want to say fights, but they are fights to protect uh, clean water and to protect the territories are also to protect our food sources, which is on the coast here mostly salmon. Yes. And and yes. there was ologists, maybe it was an anthropologist and an archaeologist that you know come and studied and observed our people quite a few years ago, and they made they noted that the coastal people are so reliant on the salmon that if the salmon ever to go extinct, so would the indigenous people, and so. Uh, so yeah, let's hope that the salmon don't go Indeed. extinct. Indeed, because we don't want the people to go extinct and either. And the cultures, and, right? And, so. and, and that way of living that's so woven together mm -hmm. that I think that those of us who think about sustainability need to relearn and reclaim in the ways that you are doing mm -hmm. with, with your people. I'm inspired. Thank you. Thank you. I think one last yeah. point would be um, in terms of non-Indigenous people, um, one thing that anybody can do is just to, especially here on Turtle Island in, in, uh, in the USA and Canada, is just to know who is the territory that you live in and work in. Thank you. And I greet you from the territory I live in are the Mayadu people who have lived there for thousands of years and we're part of the Nisanan larger group. So thank you for that reminder. And that's the reminder for you. Who are the people that lived where you live? You're watching Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. I'm with Pawa Hayupus. Thank you for joining me. Join us next time.